Hello, and welcome to Streamers and Punches, the podcast from Sound Ocean TV that looks at current events and new releases in the world of film music. My name is Bill Witham. And I'm Kevin Wilt. And just as we promised last week, we're going to discuss the new Universal Pictures logo with the new version of theme music, uh, originally created by Jerry Goldsmith and partially manhandled, I mean, uh, rearranged by Brian Tyler, and uh, as well as a couple uh, points to some interviews and some new articles in film music. So uh, first up, if you're interested in the upcoming Dark Shadows with uh, Danny Elfman's score, uh, it's the new Tim Burton movie, uh, you can check out some samples. We have the link at our website. Uh, at first, if this is the uh, this is the Slash film, oh no, The Water Tower, okay. Right, yeah, this is sorry. on the, the publisher's website. Okay. Yeah, this was first brought to my attention at Slash Film, and they just said it's the whole score. So it is actually not. It's just a good, I think, what, a, a 30 seconds to a minute chunk of each one. Yeah, it's basically like an Amazon preview kind of yeah. thing. It's yeah. like 30 seconds of each track or something. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and then there's actually a record, review of the score. Uh, Kevin, who gives the review? Uh, I don't know. It was from MTV.com. Uh, it was by the reviews by John Mitchell. The the interesting point that he makes in the review is that um, the trailers for Dark Shadows have been almost, I mean, still dark in the Tim Burton sense, but but almost kind of bubbly and comical. Um, and there's even one of the trailers has like a cameo by Alice Cooper, and it's 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 so it, it's being sold as kind of a goofy uh, sort of thing. But uh, John Mitchell says in this review that you know if you listen to the 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 Danny Elfman score, it has the the dark Danny Elfman Tim Burton kind of thing that you're expecting. So maybe it's not this kind of light weird comedy that that it's being sold as. I don't know. So it's an interesting point. Yeah, um, it's certainly go going to be. I think one of the bigger scores that's that's coming up in the next couple of months or so. Uh, there's also um, speaking of, of score previews on the UK Amazon site uh, earlier this week, they had um, samples of Alan Silvestri's The Avengers score. Uh, they've now taken it down, but um, I got a chance to listen to a little bit of it. Um, it's. It, it, it was kind of interesting. I, I don't know that I, I was able to hear enough of it before they took it down. Uh, I, I wouldn't say it's it's certainly not exactly like his Captain America score. So it'll be interesting that it has kind of crept up a little bit um, since it's been taken down from from that website. I'm not sure if it has popped up anywhere else, um, but that one should be uh, should be coming around in the next few weeks uh, as well. I believe. What's the release date on that? Oh, I think it's like April May. April twentieth. April well in the UK okay. it's April twentieth so okay should be should be coming around pretty soon I guess okay all right cool um, I you know I like to uh, update our listeners and anybody else on new CD uh, versions coming out whether it's an expanded CD or or a reissue or just has never come out before and uh, it's kind of like it's like Daniel Schweiger's prophecy is definitely coming true. About every week now, they keep announcing more and more interesting soundtracks that have been hugely in demand for years. And we've seen uh, Hook, the two CD. Uh, we've seen White Fang. We see a new reissue, reissue of Predator. Uh, not too long ago, we saw Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. And it continues uh, with another Star Trek movie, Star Trek First Contact, which is probably arguably the, the, the best with the Next Generation crew in it. And has some great lines, all but all by Patrick Stewart. Uh, that has an expanded release coming out. And if you, if any of our listeners recall, that wasn't just uh, Jerry Goldsmith that uh, created the score, but he also worked with Joel Goldsmith, his son. And a couple of the cues that are not only memorable but are not on the original CD release were actually composed by Joel Goldsmith. So they will be on the expansion. I think one of them being Flight of the Phoenix, and um, uh, that's probably the main one at this point that I could think of right off the top of my head. So a great score, and the CD release uh, earlier for the when the actual movie came out in the, the late 90s was, was decent, but um, about 45 minutes, and this clocks in at quite a bit longer. So uh, look for this about mid-April is when this is looking to come out, and then it was recently announced that uh, Galaxy Quest 
by David Newman, which has also been uh, a fan favorite for a while, and it's just been unreleased. So uh, that's one of his more recognizable scores. David Newman, whom we rarely ever talk about, if any at all, on this podcast, has been writing Hollywood scores for a very long time and is in the Newman family. So is, um, I forget all the, the family tree, but is, I believe, the, the nephew of Randy and the brother of Thomas. Well, anyway, he's Something connected like to the, yeah, he's connected to the, uh, to the, uh, the Newman family because he's one of them. And, and he more likely uh, than Thomas is kind of a chameleon when it comes to composing scores. So he writes a lot of film scores uh, often and has a, a, a stronghold on like the vernacular uh, or rather sort of the vocabulary and the style of, of all these different um, Hollywood movies, whether it's a romantic comedy or a straight up comedy or science fiction movie. But with Galaxy Quest, this score was a lot more memorable and had, had sort of large themes. And it was, like I said, that's why it went over really well with fans. And now it'll be available. So look out for Galaxy Quest uh, in the next month or so. It'll become available and I'm sure it'll sell out really quickly. Uh, let's see, uh, Atticus Ross, uh, most famously associated with um, Trent Reznor and their scores for the David Fincher movies. Uh, he's going to be working on 47 Ronin, and I believe Keanu Reeves is in that. Is that not right, Kevin? That's right. Yeah. Okay. So um, stay tuned for that samurai epic, because I'm sure it'll be like, whoa, epic. Anyway. <laughs> Um, yeah, this one. This one is the movie itself is actually being released in uh, in November. So I think this announcement was just that he was now uh, attached to score this film. I don't think he's actually finished the score yet or anything. So okay, okay. Um, and let's see. You found an interesting interview with a, a cellist. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I, I did. Um, there, there is a, a woman, a cellist named Maya Beezer. Uh, I think I might be possibly saying it right. Uh, she is. She's collaborated. She's recorded on a lot of film scores. Uh, she's worked with James Newton Howard a lot. She worked on uh, The Happening, uh, The Great Debaters, and Blood Diamond. And she's now recording music for the new Snow White and the Huntsman. Uh, but she's essentially a cellist who a, a big part of her career is playing solo cello stuff on film scores, and it's seems like a, an interesting direction, uh, kind of an interesting career direction for, for a performer. Uh, and so there's this interview um, basically learning about her, her career in that aspect and, and working on recording sessions and things like that. So getting to read about the performer pr perspective of the film scoring process is not something we get to see very often. So it's, it's an interesting article. Uh, Worth checking out because again, it's it's not a perspective that we get all the time. Usually, we're reading interviews with a composer or a director or something, but very rarely with performers. So it's it's worth checking out. But we'll have a link to it uh, up on our website, of course, which is soundnotion.tv/sap. Cool. Yeah, and uh, last up, there was an interesting uh, article. I got this through a link on Facebook, but. Um, it's a recent article that was posted on, I think it was LA Times. Yeah. Yes. And this involves the the different houses that create music for movie trailers. And what what they go on to describe is that often because music is the last component added in a film, and while it may even still be uh, worked on in the studios, or while it's actually probably being composed, they need to get the advertising already started for the film. So what they'll do for the marketing is they will seek out uh, a, a composing house to create the music for two and a half minutes of trailer footage. <clears throat> and what this article is, uh, what it interestingly points out is that there's a, a group called Two Steps From Hell, and they're sort of the highlight of the article, although it does name uh, Future World Music and Audio Machine uh, as just two other companies that do the same job, which is basically... They create short pieces, about two and a half to three minutes, uh, I guess, give or take 30 seconds here or there. And they create them in a style that works with, I suppose, they have to keep a pulse on whatever the latest trend is, whether it's heavy percussion or melody or textural or what, what have you. But um, they basically fashion these small pieces 
and create uh, a dozen or so, and then the uh, the houses will then listen to them and, and license them for a considerable amount of money. And so they're composers and they get paid for creating music, and it's music that is put to footage, but it's not music that's conceived of with that footage. So anyway, it's an interesting article, and Kevin and I were discussing a little bit earlier and looking at sort of the different points of it, and it's kind of an, an interesting point-counterpoint discussion because um, of, of, well, well, let's, let's talk about, Kevin, what's your, what's your take on the, the use of uh, creating this trailer music mm-hmm. for, for an unseen trailer and, uh, and then sort of marketing it as music that may be used and you have no idea how it'll be used, but then you'll make money off of it. Right. I mean, it, it's not exactly something new. I mean, there have been music libraries around for a long time, particularly supplying music for, for television. I mean, we, we interviewed uh, Keith Horn a few months ago, who had written um, a lot of a lot of library music for television and for uh, commercials and things like that. This this seems to be, I guess, just a newer offshoot of that same sort of industry. Uh, you know, Bill, you'd mentioned that we were talking about this earlier, and we talked about from an artistic perspective, some of the benefits um, or, or traps you kind of fall into with writing music, not even for a specific trailer, but music that hopefully someone will choose for their trailer. And, and what are some of the opportunities um, and, and and pitfalls of that? And, and, and you had brought up a point. You had said that... Um, you know, it's it's and, and even the the article um, the article uh, mentions this as well is that you're you're not attached to a picture or to a director. So you know, even at the end of the article here, it says if you feel like you know one morning if you wake up you feel like writing action music, you write action music. You're not you're not stuck to a long term project or or under the the thumb of a director or something like that. Which I, I mean. You can definitely make the argument that that provides a certain amount of freedom, um, but but let's not kid ourselves. Music for film trailers is not it's not the most original music out there. I mean, this is music that if you're writing music for film trailers, it has to fit a certain preconceived style. If if you know. If it's going to be action music, it has to have certain things that you know all the producers are going to be looking for in music for their action trailer or whatever the case may be. So yes, you're maybe not attached to um, kind of the taste of a certain director, but I think it's also confining in the fact that you're you're now having to write something for a, a more generic market. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think they they discuss the situation they're in, and they explain, you know, how they approach it and everything else. And I don't know. I just I kind of was looking at it from a, a a really big picture point of view. That in the end, all this music kind of ends up being generic with a film or even without <laughs> anymore. Yeah. Anyway, and so I mean, that's, so that's, a part of me was kind of like true to to make the argument that. Oh well, film trailer music has to be generic. But if you're scoring a film, you can make it much more nuanced and tailored, things like that. I mean, th- that's the argument. But how many you're right? How many film scores do you hear nowadays that still have those qualities? I mean, you hear a lot of generic film scores just as much as you do hear generic movie trailer music. Right, right. I mean, it, it can either be looked at negatively, like it's all generic, or you can try to look out for positive bright spots yeah. of, of optimistic artistic approach perhaps but it's interesting because i think with uh, sometimes with film you can get bogged down into the composition by committee syndrome where the producers have to have an input and then there's the music editor and then the director of course has to sort of override the whole thing with their with their decision and then you have the poor composer sometimes stuck in the middle of it and i thought this was a really refreshing approach where the composers are actually the ones that say we're going to write it, and then now we're done with it, and you can take and use it however, but you have to pay us to license it. Of course, that would really rule if the music they wrote was kind of ballsy or had something edgy about it. And I, I did listen to a little bit of it, and it wasn't, it wasn't edgy at all. 
And right. so uh, well, that's the thing. You, you say, you know, film composers are having to write by committee where they have to they have to please you know, the music editor and the director and the producer. If you're writing these these library movie trailer pieces, you're writing you're writing by committee, except instead of having to please a small group of people, you have to try and please the entire market so that someone out there will pick up the piece of music for their trailer. That's true. I mean, depending on how the situation is, you could have a, a sort of a blind patron, and you don't know what they want, so you have to write several things to try to a, appeal to everything. Um, and then if you're on a film, you could have a very specific set of uh, requirements that you need to fulfill yeah. by, the, uh, by the director. However, I just thought what was interesting was the sort of individual sort of business element to it that that it is it is all of these things even if we sometimes want to not think of it that way so when they mentioned that that the fees for licensing some of this music can go from five to ten thousand dollars per track for international use as i'm reading here about halfway down the article um that's kind of nice to spend some time writing two and a half music, two and a half minutes of music <laughs> and then get that for it and then you can actually go off and then write something for your friends that's actually got you know some maybe some artistic sure, sure. um real expression in it or maybe you can to, slip to some of your it soul back <laughs> you sold and your then, soul yeah. and then you earn it back later uh something like that so uh so it's kind of it's kind of interesting and there's been the albums that have been out before uh i think the one that comes to mind was that um E.S. Posthumous made this album called Unearthed, and it's basically orchestra with some rhythm behind it and some choir, and basically it's about 13 or 14 tracks, and all of them can be probably used in a movie trailer somewhere, and several of them have, or at least one of them's been used, uh, and it's called Pompeii, and uh, Pompeii's been used in the Spider-Man trailer and the trailer to uh, Planet of the Apes. So he was a really big deal, like right around the turn of the century, like right around 2000 and 2001. His music was being used in a lot of places, and I'm sure he was making a good deal of, of income from that as well. And then I haven't really heard of him since, but I haven't really been paying attention to people using um, this sort of very focused form of, of writing for film indirectly. Mm -hmm. uh, so this article was sort of educational for me, but... Um, I don't know. I just I find it interesting that that this is a, a very competitive business, and um, I just kind of found it interesting and, and very yeah. educational. So, I th one of the things that, that I noticed about this article is the the two composers they're focusing on. Uh, one of them is a guy named Nick Phoenix. Now, Nick Phoenix uh, has played a large role with um, the East West company that produces many different sample libraries, and he's a producer on many of those. Um, so it seems like he has his hands in, in several different areas of, of production when it comes to film music and sample libraries and things like that. So it's always interesting to see how those things are, are kind of connected together. Mm -hmm. Now, something else that the article mentions that's really interesting is maybe our listeners don't know it or not, but soundtrack albums tend to not sell as well as, say, Black Eyed Peas or, um, I don't know, Kanye West or Beyonce or, or whatever. So, whatever the kids are listening to these days. Taylor Swift. You just sound like a really old man right now, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever. Um, so they don't sell that much. And so if you can get six-figure sales, that's uh, you're doing really well. And they were just noticing that uh, this music that's created by these companies is usually not available by the public. So it makes sense, right? If you write this music, you're going to deal directly with those uh, advertising houses. But they said that uh, the group Two Steps From Hell, which is the sort of highlight of the article, has, uh, has decided to sell their music, and they have sold more than 300,000 copies. of. Uh, they have two albums, and they've sold it through the iTunes store. So that's, um, uh, that's something. So that's yeah. kind of interesting, but anyway, it's it's uh, it could be the beginning of a of a, a new sort of offshoot uh, category of, of of music. Who knows? But video game music is big too, and it's kind of the same musical sort of format. It's sort of music that sounds cinematic, but sometimes I don't think they're writing to picture. They're just kind of like, here's your characters. You have a troll and a 
knight and there's a bad guy and so as long as it's epic epic is the magic word always right Right. so um anyway that's uh that's just something for our our listeners to check out so uh you can see the link to the la times article on our website at soundnotion.tv slash sap so pretty cool stuff um okay so the universal music so there is a new uh version of jerry goldsmith's fanfare that he wrote and premiered originally in 1997 to Jurassic Park or the Lost World Jurassic Park, which is essentially Jurassic Park 2. And for me personally, I remember really enjoying the James Horner, the one that came before it, and kind of feeling like, hey, Universal, you just you just got yourself a new logo with new music by James Horner. What are you doing? But they brought in the Jerry Goldsmith music, and um, and it's kind of stuck ever since. And I always thought it was cool because if your movie theater has stereo surround sound, um, the the horn call that happens three times in this fanfare happens once on, I believe, the right side first, and then the left side, and then in the center. So it's like it's testing your theater sound system, which I thought was kind of a nice... Um, that was done very intentionally, I believe. Was Oh, was it? Yeah, it was, it was orchestrated and recorded in such a way as to kind of give you this surround sort of experience. That kind of thing doesn't happen by accident. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Did you read that somewhere? Um, no, I learned that a couple of years ago. I don't remember where, where I ran into that, but... I thought you were going to say, like... You could also just be making it up by this point. I really don't know. I met somebody who was there, and they did it, and they yeah. that's why they did it. <laughs> So anyway, um, it's a cool fanfare, and it's it's pretty straightforward, and mostly horn driven, just like a lot of great Goldsmith action cues. Um, and then the full orchestra comes in on the third, on the third sort of um, uh, third fanfare part, section of it. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so it has now been kind of like re, I guess, reorchestrated by Brian Tyler for the 100th anniversary of Universal Pictures. And uh, so we are we're gonna play the uh, just that little bit, and then we want to discuss it. So let's see, Dave, if you could. So Kevin, you've heard that before now a couple times. Is that right? Um, this was the first time I've heard the complete Brian Tyler version of it. I've uh, there were a couple of videos online that I think I mentioned last week of um, him talking about this process, and you hear like a little bit of the actual music while you're seeing the orchestra, and someone's doing a voiceover or whatever. But yeah. So yeah, I'm not I'm super familiar with it. That was the first time I'd heard. The entire thing all the way through without anything else going on. So, okay. Any thoughts? I don't know. I, I think I think Brian Tyler was an interesting choice to to do this. I don't know. I'm not exactly sure why why they chose him over over other composers. I'm, I don't really have anyone else in mind. Um, it just seems like an interesting an interesting choice to choose Brian Tyler to do this particular project. Well, he's been um, the, like the go-to composer a couple times when, uh, like Jerry Goldsmith's score for Timeline wasn't used. Then they brought in Brian Tyler and he rescored the whole film. And then when Jerry Goldsmith passed away and they made another Rambo movie, they brought in Brian Tyler and he used all of Jerry Goldsmith's themes mm-hmm. for the Rambo film. And there may be uh, there may be some other example in there. He did score a uh, Alien vs. Predator movie, but I'm not counting that, even though Goldsmith did score the first Alien movies. <laughs> Great score, by the way. But uh, that has very little to do with Brian Tyler there. Um, yeah, I mean, basically on the surface, it's just the same music. But I find a couple of choices interesting. Like, like uh, I kind of think that Goldsmith kind of put into it what it needed, and he didn't see fit to add a sort of unnecessary baseline that was yeah. sort of really kind of very simplistic counterpoint, if you even want to call it that. But that's in there now. So, um, it so does, I mean, my, my first impression of it was that it's, 
it's pretty much everything from the Goldsmith version with some other stuff. <laughs> That's Brian Tyler's contribution. Yeah, I, I suppose. The other stuff. And I kind of look at it like, I guess if your name's going on it, like, hey, you're doing the 100-year version, and I guess you feel that you have to add something. So there's no bass line there, so better add one. Um, there's no snare drum playing the same rhythm of the brass near the end, so I'd better add that. I kind of think the additions are, are unnecessary, and they kind of sound silly to me. It's kind of like middle school band music now, where, like, it was already bad enough before where there's so many doublings, but now there's so many more doublings. It's it's just kind of what it feels like. And yeah. and now everyone's in playing. So it's even more of that kind of that um like sugar coated orchestrational approach. Just let everyone play something at the same yeah. time. We got a hundred players. If some is good, then more is better. It's, yeah. You know. We want a hundred players to all be heard because they're all playing at the same time. Yeah, we're and we're gonna cram them all into twenty four seconds of music. Right, and all that budget better be up on the screen. <laughs> right, that's right. So, but on the, I mean, so okay, so I'm, 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 maybe I'm harsh, but I don't really think the changes are necessary. I think the music was perfectly fine before. I'd rather just see them since it's a hundred years. I'd rather just see them do brand new music. I mean, pick Brian Tyler to write it. Yeah, or, it, it's or, it didn't it didn't seem like it was different enough to justify doing. Well, here's what was funny was from uh, 1991 when Back to the Future Part 3 came out, or I'm sorry, 1990, that's when they had the 75th anniversary, which has this great uh, sort of retrospective um, montage, which is different than the one we have lined up at the end of the show, mm-hmm. by the way. But you can find it on YouTube or just you know check out Back to the Future Part 3. And it's all James Horner's music. And then in 97... They threw that out in favor of Goldsmith's new music. That's what I thought. Six years is not, or seven, seven years is uh, not that long. Right. And right. I don't remember if it was, if for the James Horner version in 90, that was a 75-year anniversary for Universal Pictures. So uh, seven years later would just be in, um, an 82nd year anniversary. That doesn't really make any sense. So they brought in new music, and I guess they really wanted to test the stereo speakers. But it's stuck ever since, and now I think more than ever, a hundred-year anniversary should warrant brand new music, and they did. Right, so. exactly. If if you were if you were gonna kind of start from scratch and have some brand new music written, it should it would make more sense for that to be for the one hundredth anniversary, and and not just kind of a basic revamp. But again, it seems like it's so similar to the Goldsmith version that. It's just kind of a little extra extra polish. If it's if you want to make a big deal of the 100th anniversary, why not why not hire Brian Tyler to to write something completely brand new and yeah. not just yeah. adding a couple of things on top? Yeah, yeah. Or even um, anybody else who's prominent, you know, Danny Elfman, um, Alan Silvestri, James Newton Howard. Those guys can all turn in a really decent movie intro and they all have on on uh for other studios but um anyway it's just kind of it's kind of interesting so anyway that's the new okay. version and then we'll close out today's episode um in just a moment with the uh, with the montage that includes the james horner version as well as the jerry goldsmith and then a few from before those uh those were written in uh, mm-hmm. from uh, older generations um should we mention, should we mention the version that that John Williams kind of took over for the 20th anniversary of E.T. Okay, Kevin, you can mention it. So so this was in 2002, the 20th anniversary of E.T., John Williams. He basically did what he did with the, the Alfred Newman 20th Century Fo- uh, Fox fanfare, which is he took the original thing and then added some more stuff at the end. And he basically did it with Jerry Goldsmith's Universal fanfare. He takes the fanfare, and then because it's E.T., he he puts a little ET tag at the end, and this was um, because the the Universal Globe um, turns into the Amblin Moon with Elliot and ET flying in the bike over the moon. So that's when he brings in the ET music. Dave, I think has it queued up. So why don't we why don't we listen to to this one as well? Because we can. That's right. Because of the intranet.
I'm very happy now. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, Kevin, what have you been listening to this week? Uh, not a whole lot. I, I've actually been out of town to uh, go hear a concert at uh, Indiana University. But one thing I did run into this week that was that was uh, new to me, and it's actually a score that you've talked about a couple of times, Bill, uh, and that is Hans Zimmer's score to Rango, which that movie just showed up on, on iTunes or on, uh, excuse me, Netflix streaming, and I, and I watched part of it last night. I, I've, I've come to the realization that, generally speaking, I, I, I kind of like it, Hans Zimmer's scores when they're not for big Hollywood blockbusters. When he is scoring big Hollywood blockbusters is when the music usually drives me kind of crazy. Because he gets he, it's with with Rango, it's a very weird film, very uh, weird, very weird, and and you can kind of tell that he's having fun playing with that weirdness because he does a lot of really kind of goofy things, and it's not just kind of rumbling, um, big Hollywood Hans Zimmer kind of sound. So I won't say much more about it than that because I know you've mentioned it a couple times in the show already, but that's kind of the newest thing that I've run into this week. And, of course, I mentioned last week that the new Hook um, limited edition two-disc set has, has come out, and I've been listening to a bit of that uh, as well. Yeah. What about you, Bill? Yeah, uh, same same with the Hook. Uh, I, I really love it. I was actually around 1991, I guess, when that movie came out, and that was my first... Oh, I think that was my first cassette tape soundtrack that I, I started to like make a conscious effort to actually go out and start collecting. So I think that was my first, uh, well, no, I, I got the seed. No, it was a cassette tape. Yeah. And, uh, I, I pretty much wore it out. I, I replaced it a few years later with the CD, but, um, yeah, yeah. I just, I, I really always enjoyed that score. It's, it's way overwritten, but the movie is way overdone. So it perfectly oh, yeah. fits. Yeah. It perfectly fits the movie, but the fact that it's way overwritten, means that it's just like overflowing with melody and counterpoint and texture and great orchestration. So when you go back and listen to it, there's almost no need to try to imagine what the visuals are. It's just it's just a story that tells itself. So every little, you know, um, flight that Tinkerbell flies around or every menacing pirate or gesture by Captain Hook, it's all in the movie or every transformation for Peter Pan yeah, or a realization. It's all there. So it's a lot of fun. And all the music that I've always noticed in the back of the movie that I wanted to hear more of, it, it's there now. The weird right. thing about it is that they didn't resequence any of the music to be literally replaying the movie. They kept the arrangements like what John Williams did. So if John Williams took a cue from later but put it on this cue that happens in the movie at this time because it sort of makes musical um, – it sort of has musical variety and makes musical sense. Yeah. They kept that intact, but then just added back in all the other music that wasn't previously available, which I thought was interesting because most of the time when these expansions occur, the, um, the editors have their way with the music at the, at the mercy of, or at the risk of, um, of undoing what the composer sometimes had arranged to make it more musically satisfying. So that, that wasn't the case here. Um, right. so that was cool. And any fans out there, if you can still get a, get a hold of that, get a copy of it, um, do because it'll probably sell out and, um, and it's worth it if you like that music. And then I saw 21 jump street, uh, with our friend, Matt, he's a composer as well. And the music was by Mark mother's ball. And I don't remember a single note of it. So, so yay, Mark, for writing a score that completely blends in with the film, and I don't even a know. Ringing endorsement from Streamers um, and Punches. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> good, talk, good talk. I saw a whole movie, and I remember not one note of the score. <laughs> um, I didn't really go into the movie uh, thinking I really want to notice what the score does, but um, I did see the movie, so technically that's what I saw this week, and uh, maybe I should have noticed it more, but it's not really a movie that one would go to to um, sort of separate the score to listen to and, and see what new things Mark Mother's Ball is doing. And there was none that I could tell. So he's just, you know, that's just his job, and he just wrote a score. So there it is. <laughs> but the movie was funny, even though it was a, a remake. So, so there's that. Anyway, all right, so uh, that'll do it for this episode of Streamers and Punches. You can listen to us on our website of soundnotion.tv slash SAP.
uh, where you can also subscribe to our show, leave comments, and find links to the music we spoke about. You can also subscribe to the show through iTunes. Thanks again for listening. My name is Bill Witham. And I'm Kevin Wilt. And we'll leave you with the montage of Universal Pictures from 1929 through 2011. And just please note that it may take a second before you hear anything because the plane that you will hear without music is what starts it off. So give it a second and enjoy. Enjoy.